Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this dissertation defense of Julian Michaels. My name is Helge Osterhold. I'm one of the core faculty in the East-West Psychology Program here at the California Institute of Integral Studies. Um, it's my pleasure to um, be the chair and the host of this event. Um, we'll have the defense for Julian's dissertation that is titled When God Was Green and Dancing, A Hillmanian Regeneration of the Ecological Masculine at the Roots of Modernity. And um, I, before we hear from Julian about this, I just want to introduce the committee uh, members as well as tell everybody a little bit on uh, the structure of the day. So it's my pleasure to welcome our external committee member, Dr. Renee Soul. Uh, Dr. Sol is an eco-psychologist with a background in German literature and wilderness psychology and eco-psychology. She's the author of uh, such contributions as a uh, multicultural approach to eco-psychology. She wrote on psychology and consumer culture, the struggle for a good life in a materialistic society, um, as well as other um, eco-psychological journal and uh, chapters. We also have here uh, my pleasure to welcome my colleague, Dr. Ch Craig Chalquist. He's a professor, author, consultant um, who writes and teaches at the intersection of psyche, story, and imagination. Amongst his uh, numerous publications are uh, Myths Amongst Us, When Timeless Tales Return to Life, as well as uh, Terra Psychology. And I saw, Craig, that you just have a new book coming, Wisdom Sayings of Jesus the Gnostic. So looking forward to that at some point as well. Welcome, everyone. And we also have here Stefan Julik, our CIS uh, EWP program manager and uh, faculty who will also uh, help uh, us get through the day smoothly. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Julian Michaels, our PhD candidate here, um, who will have about uh, 45 minutes or so, maybe a little bit more, to present on his dissertation to uh, get us at least, uh, for everyone who hasn't read it, a basic orientation of uh, what he was trying to accomplish here, what he did in his research and his work. Um, after his presentation, we, the committee will have uh, some time to ask questions, um, offer comments, assessments of the work, and we'll be in conversation with Julian for a little bit. Uh, then we will go to a breakout room. The committee will by ourselves to confer, to discuss uh, if any further changes are needed uh, or um, how we overall assess uh, Julian's work, we come back. During that time when we're in the discussion breakout room, the rest of the audience will get a chance to uh, engage with Julian, ask questions, um, share their thoughts, and uh, we'll come back uh, with uh, the decision. So overall, uh, somewhere between an hour and a half, uh, or a little bit more, that's kind of what we're aiming for here this morning. And um, yeah. Julian, I'll hand the microphone over to you and looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Helge. Hello, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to see all of you, many faces that I haven't seen in a while, uh, family and, and friends and teachers. I, this has been an extraordinary journey for me at this moment. Um, time and coming a deep process so um it's you know it's ineffable that the the journey and where and uh coming to this moment and sharing this with you now after after all the places i've been and things that i've learned along the way i uh, can't really can't really give words to it but i'll try to share something of uh of um, my journey my process and you know, I've come to see this whole uh, shared education of culture that we're in together as being a um, a deep a deep process of us together, kind of making sense of our lives 
and it's it's a deep feeling thing. So this is my participation in that in this moment. Uh, so I've prepared a slideshow uh, to tour you through the the larger mind here of of the work. Uh, I need to share screen here, I guess. Does anyone remember how to do that? Down at the bottom of your screen, there should be a green button. Share screen. If you click on that, it'll open up to the various screens that you have available to you. Oh, here we go. Should just now it's here. Okay, so as I'm sharing screen now. Can you all see see the slideshow? Yes, we yeah. can see. Okay, great. great. It's working, yep. All right. So the title, as Helge said, of this dissertation is When God Was Green and Dancing, a Hillmanian Regeneration of the Ecological Masculine at the Roots of Modernity. Um, the, the work itself is about 300 pages, this, what, I've, what I've written so far, um, and it covers a lot of ground and a lot of topics. So in thinking about what to do here today, my, my committee has already read those 300 pages. So it made sense to me to design this talk for folks who haven't read those 300 pages to bring you into the work and help you understand what I'm doing. So some of the questions, key topics that I want to address today are, who am I and how do I relate to this work? What is a Helmanian regeneration? Uh, which another word that I'll use for that is epistrophic therapia. So I will define that and unpack that. What do I mean by wilderness and how does it relate to depth psychology, ecstasy, myth, and dream? Who is the green man that I'm talking about here? And what does this have to do with modern civilization and with us today? I'll start with this quote. This is a really nice quote by Nietzsche. And here stands man, stripped of myth, eternally starving, in the midst of all the past ages, digging and scrabbling for roots, even if he must dig for them in the most remote antiquities. What is indicated by the great historical need of unsatisfied modern culture clutching about for countless other cultures with its consuming desire for knowledge, if not the loss of myth, the loss of the mythical home, the mythical womb. Let us consider whether the feverish and sinister agitation of this culture is anything other than a starving man's greedy grasping for food. And who would wish to give further nourishment to a culture such as this, unsatisfied by everything it devours, which transforms the most powerful, wholesome nourishment into, quote, history and criticism. So that summarizes something of the, the situation that I came into this work with. And for me, that situation is you know, a lot of what Nietzsche's talking about here is this sense of alienation from some sort of a deeper, the mythical womb, as he says, the mythical home, alienation that we all feel here in, I think, the modern civilization, modern world today. And it seems to be related to things that we can view happening in the world, because this alienation from the world seems linked in some profound ways to our relationship with the world, which is our relationship with nature. And that's becoming um, very evident in the ways we treat the world and what's happening to that living world that we live in and as part of. So, you know, in my own life, in some way, and I talk about this in my dissertation, these, these experiences, these things that are happening in the world, I started sensing intuitively very young. And I think probably many of us do particularly in a community like this, probably many of us do. Um, for me, it was overwhelming. 
the sense of alienation and the sense of what was happening in nature and in the world really hit my heart hard from a young age. And from quite young, as my, I have some of my parents here too, who were with me in, th in my childhood, and they, they remember how much I was terrorized by nightmares and by fear throughout my childhood. I didn't know how to understand it at that time, but it, it became more and more clear what I was really scared of through time. So for me, the, this journey began around the age of 10 and 11 with transforming nightmares, uh, meditation and then lucid nightmares. And gradually that has expanded for me from the personal to a recognition that that, that work is actually work in the world. So the, the recognition that nightmare energy is a collective energy and its transformation needs to be collective as well, which I think is part of the work that we're doing here. So this question, and by here, I mean in depth psychology and dream psychology and myth psychology and the psychology of story. So this raises the question, how does one face and transform nightmares? And as I said, that's, that was the sensitive child's very important question. It was a very personally important question for me. So here's a couple of quotes by Jung addressing something like, what is the gift of the nightmare? Jung says, the psychological rule says that when an inner, inner situation is not made conscious, it happens outside as fate. Of course, nightmares make our inner situations very, very conscious. He also says, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. The latter procedure, however, is disagreeable and therefore not popular. So there's this, this journey that happens from these nightmarish images towards an opening that has to do with lucidity or consciousness, which becomes... Um, I don't know if objective is the right word, but it becomes, it becomes curious or interested in the dream. So I call this the inner mastery of the living dream. And the note that in this kind of field, we're not after light, as Jung says, we're not after imagining figures of light, but we're after awareness with the whole, awareness with the whole process. So I like these images as this kind of awakening into the information of dream and myth. And this is also related to a phrase that uh, Jungians have used, the mundus imaginalis, which is the imaginal world. So part of what, part of what we need to do here in order to take this work uh, seriously, to, to open to this work, is to recognize that myth and dream are not, they're not, they're not pretend. They're not things that only happen when we're asleep. Imagination, this, and this is, from, this is also from Hillman, uh, James Hillman, who's a major guide in my work. Imagination pervades all perception and all thought. We're never, we're never not in imagination. In that sense, we're never not dreaming. Dream is always a part of our experience. So it's not imaginary. Imagination is not imaginary. It isn't unreal. Rather, it's a mode or a level of perception. So depth psychology is partly a return to what was once a universal awareness of the power and influence within this imaginal dimension of reality. And to give a example or a, a parallel to this kind of um, once universal awareness, I've shown here the Tibetan wheel of life or wheel of Dharma, which is actually an illustration of the different the different uh, layers or dimensions of consciousness within, within reality, within this reality. So it goes all the way from hell realms to heaven realms with a lot of spaces in between. And these are not just dreams, they're actually ways that we can experience life that open through um, consciousness, which is also through dream. And if anyone is been through life-changing shifts, then they might know something about what it's like when a new door opens in, in one's own kind of inner dream or imagination that one can be something new, that new possibilities are present. And it can be like a whole new world has appeared. 
So the Tibetans would call that, the Tibetan Buddhists would call that lokas. Lokas are these different worlds, different dimensions. So I want to address here the nervousness around the non-rational, the fear of superstition. I want to say first that to honor the imaginal, to honor the dream realms, doesn't mean abandoning critical thinking. One thing that I discuss in my dissertation is this distinction. And I actually note, along with other scholars, that superstition, metaphysical superstition, I believe in this, I believe in that, you know, uh, is actually an effort to turn toward these imaginal and subtle realms by taking them literally and materially. So what's interesting about that is that ironically, it betrays a bias toward literal and material realms. In other words, it's based on this feeling, this assumption that something has to be material in order to be important or real. So a spirit has to be a ghost moving things materially in order for us to take it seriously in order for us to treat it as real. On the other hand, if we really want to restore honor to the imaginal and subtle realms, then we actually have to let go of this assumption. This is a deeper re-enchantment to take seriously, to take as real what is not necessarily material, but which does have a, re a very real effect on our reality and our shared reality. So one might call this one of the layers of new participation. Um, participatory or participation is usually used to refer to ancient peoples or indigenous cultures. So new participation refers to the return toward an embrace of this full holistic range of human capacities. We have both rational and non-rational capacities as humans, right? We have intuition and dreams. We also have logic and mathematics. We can access all of that and it's all very powerful. So this kind of new participation is an embrace of that entire range of what's possible for us, the entire range of our intelligence and consciousness. So to take, to take the mundus imaginalis seriously, to take dream seriously, to take subtle realms seriously, to take the imaginal as a power in the world means that it is our responsibility, along with stewarding the material world, also to steward what you could call the soul of the world, which Jungians have also called the anima mundi, the soul of the world, which Hillman also called the soul in the world. Not just the soul of the world, but the soul in the world, which is a recognition that the underworld, as Hillman might call it, is like a dream that's within all things, inside, not beneath, not some separate realm, not somewhere else, but inside everything, as the, the metaphorical, dreaming, imaginal, poetic resonances within everything. Everything has its, its body of associations. Like I said, there's always a dream that's happening. We are always in some way dreaming which means that everything we perceive and everything we experience has a dream layer to it. So that's, that's a lot of what Hillman draws out in his work. And that is the soul in the world, in all phenomena in the world. So this is James Hillman, who I have been referencing. Um, he passed away a little over a decade ago. And here are some of his key ideas. I, I write a great, one of my chapters is completely devoted pretty much to Hellman. And he's been a major guide for me in thinking as a psychologist. So here's some of his ideas. One of them is therapia, which Hillman didn't just mean therapy with an individual. For Hillman, therapia, healing, was something that we did with a culture, with the ideas and the myths of the collective. And Hillman was also by ancestry, uh, Jewish American coming from Jewish roots. And so this relates to the idea also of tikkun olam, which is the mending of the, the mending of the, you could, the, the, the divine in the world. I write about that in the dissertation as well. 
And this, this connects to the second notion here, epistrophe, which Hillman drew out from the Neoplatonist Proclus. And epistrophe has, is, a, is a way of doing this to put along, this therapy. And the idea is that healing happens when we trace things, sometimes broken things or dysfunctional things, but if we trace them to their roots, if we trace them to their essence, then we find their, 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 their fundamental function, what they're intended for, what they're meant to be. And that tracking to the essence of things is epistrophe and the idea that this is really what healing is, at least for Hillman. Healing is not making something different from the outside. It's tracking each thing to what its essence is, to what it's meant to be. And that's where each thing will find its healing. This also relates to this next idea that's very strong in Hillmanian thought, archetypal pluralism. And Hillman described himself often as a, a pagan thinker. And archetypal pluralism is kind of a pagan idea. And it's the notion that there is not uh, a single, there's not a single way to be. There's not a single measure of what's right. Rather, each thing needs, can be measured according to its, its divine principles. So one way to talk about that is in terms of the myths or the gods or the archetypes, which is a way of trying to do epistrophe, to look at, to look at things happening in the world and say, what god does this belong to? What myth does this belong to? What dream is this acting out? And when we do that, part of what that does is it, is it, restores, um, it, it restores dignity to a bigger range of things because we, we're not comparing everything to just one way of being. Not everything is just being compared to Jesus, right? Jesus is one beautiful thing. Buddha is another beautiful thing. A flower is another beautiful thing. And this and this and this and this. And so we can look for each thing's unique beauty and tra trace it to its divine beauty. And that's, that work is never done. It's never a completed system, which gets into the next point here, non-literalism, which is that we always need to be careful of pinning things down with a complete system. Rather, we want to stay in the realm of a certain kind of poetry, even when we're doing this kind of psychological or scholarly work, that it's really a work of beauty, a work of aesthetics, a work of meaning, a work of therapy, of healing, not a work of trying to pin things down which would be to reduce them to one system rather than trying to track them to their uniqueness. And finally, this last part here of Hillman, which is eco-psychology. He was also one of, the, one of the founders, one of the people who helped to bring about this movement of eco-psychology. So why eco-psychology? What does all of this other stuff have to do with eco-psychology? And this gets into what I'm calling here the deep wilderness. I pinpoint modernity's dysfunction in my work as an inherited or ancestral alienation or disconnection from wilderness. I talk a lot about wilderness in that. What is wilderness though? It's the ecology of life that's unfolding beyond ego domestication, beyond the human mind's control. As such, wilderness, as I use it, is, is found in forests, is found in jungles, is found in mountains, is found in the ocean, but it's also in the depths of the living bodies, including our own living bodies and our living psyches. That is in the wilderness of soul or dream. These also are unfolding with a kind of wildness, an ecology of life, a system of relationships that is beyond the ego domestication. We are not in control when it comes to what's happening in our deep bodies, or in our deep dreams. Notably, we dream individually, but through webs of relations like ancestry and culture, education, parenting, so on and so forth. This dream wilderness is also intersubjective and co-emergent. We are evolving it together. We are dreaming together, not just privately at night. So modernity's amnesia. The participatory return to wilderness, which I've defined as the living earth, the living body, and the living dream, is both something new, 
as I talked about, a new participation. It's new for us, and in many ways, it's new. It's a new synthesis. It's new for this kind of people to be doing this. And it's also a circling back toward a more normal human existence. What do I mean by that? I mean that holistic modes of co-creative relations with the powers of wilderness, holistic modes of co-creative relations with the powers of wilderness have been the rule in human life since long before the beginning of history. We are something new. Being divorced from this is something more new. Being separated or at odds with this wilderness, with these different kinds of wilderness, seeing them as the enemy, that's kind of something new. The rule is co-creation with wilderness in each of these ways. So what I'm, when I'm saying these normal relations of co-creation have been obscured for us by a civilization based on fear, conquest, and control of the processes of life and death. So I've been very interested in, for many years, about the sources of this kind of disconnection. That's my, been part of my effort to get a grip on this collective nightmare, these, some of these aspects of the collective nightmare. And, uh, you know, when we look at ancient and indigenous peoples, it becomes clear that this disconnection doesn't seem to be a universal human experience. So it must be rooted in history. It must have been something that developed. When we look for the earliest clear evidence of that cultural shift, I suggest that it's found in mid to late Sumer. I discussed this in my dissertation. I focus a lot on the Sumerians because that's when I see these shifts happening. The, at least the earliest records that I see these shifts happen. It seems to be when it starts, sort of, at least when a lot of it starts, which is during the rise of the first large scale agricultural and urban developments. And also, I, so I talk a lot about the Sumerians in my work, the early Sumerians, the mid Sumerians, and the late Sumerians. The Epic of Gilgamesh comes from the late Sumerian period when these changes have really kind of set in. And I give a full chapter to the Epic of Gilgamesh, it's, which tells the story of the figure that's been called the first hero of civilization, the first hero of the early walled cities of Sumer who achieved his fame, if you really read the epic, he achieved his fame by waging a war against the nature gods who had been long worshiped by his own ancestors. So it's this ecocidal, he, he chops down the, the forests, he humiliates and desecrates the, go the goddess's sacred place. This is the story. So this ecocidal tyrant and warlord is very notably called the founding hero the first hero of modern civilization. If you look at this, this sculpture of him, this relief of him, he's holding the lion here. And I wanna note, we'll see the lion come up repeatedly because the lion was a traditional companion to the goddess Inanna, who is the Sumerian, the, maybe the, the most, certainly the most famous and most popular Sumerian fertility goddess. Here's a quote by Paul Shepard about this kind of period. Urbanized man came to live with his own fabrications as the environment. What remained outside his jurisdiction, the otherness of wilderness, internal and external, death and the mysteries of growth and decay would be repressed by his anxious fears. And this too would push him back toward those ready-made defenses that protect the infant from his own helplessness unconscious fantasies and projections. These would disguise the wild beasts with his own ferocity. So Paul Shepard here is talking about the beginning of humanity making, making nature its enemy, its other. So this is the situation that, that we've landed in here. Um, and I, I discussed this obviously in a much greater depth in, in the work, but I wanted to kind of just pin, pinpoint what I see as, as the turning point and what lands us here. So 
the next question, obviously, once we start asking, once we start, uh, you know, having some answers to what happened, the question starts arising, you know, what next? <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> and so here's a quote from uh, Martin Heidegger, who said, the only possibility available to us is that by thinking and poeticizing, we prepare a readiness for the appearance of a God or for the absence of a God in our decline, insofar as in view of the absent God, we are in a state of decline. In view of the absent God, we are in a state of decline. Now, many people have had struggled to make heads or tails of this quote, and I don't know what Heidegger meant, but I will tell you that my reading on this has to do with the kind of gods of life or connection with the living divine that I talk about here, which is nature. And so here we've seen some real breakthroughs in an aspect of this return within the last, within the last couple centuries. And I wanted to point out here a lineage that the goddess feminists, the goddess reconstructionists have certainly drawn attention to. This I've labeled this slide, the return and evolution of Mother Earth, this goddess figure. And we can see she has a very old lineage. Now, of course, many people would not see this as a continuous figure. I argue in my dissertation that there's a lot of reasons to see a continuous tradition throughout time. So here on the left, we have the Venus of Willendorf, the oldest or certainly one of the oldest and most beautiful of the uh, fertility figurines from long, long ago. In the middle, we have Inanna or Ishtar, who was the Sumerian uh, goddess of fertility, the fertility of the soil, the mountain, um, nature, grain. She became the goddess, the patroness of grain agriculture and the silo. There's layers to it. And I, I certainly discuss this a lot in the work. So just note that if we call her a fertility goddess, we're just, that's really a placeholder for a very big, symbolism, but the, but the topic of this work is not to draw out all the themes of Inanna. That is something I, I try to bring attention to in the dissertation, um, but I don't really have time to, to analyze the fullness of her mythos here. It is cool, however, you know, when you look at these old images, when you look at these old goddesses, we have to, we have to note that peoples then didn't have a sense of the globe. There was no sense of the earth floating in space. So, this is the photo of, taken in 1968 of Earthrise from the moon. And this, of course, that wasn't the beginning of an understanding of the planet, but, but, but it's, a, it's a major image in seeing the planet as a whole. And the view of the Earth as a whole in this way is isn't, 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 fairly new in certain respects. So to see Mother Earth, to see the, the, the Earth goddess, not just as the goddess of the soil, but the goddess of a biosphere, of a planet, that is an evolution as well. That's a fairly recent evolution. But, but all of this, you know, this has been something that's been discussed at great, in great and analyzed in great depth by the goddess reconstructionists. So a big part of my work has been noticing and really giving a closer study to the fact that Inanna and these, these earth goddess figures Traditionally, the fact is they don't typically appear alone. It's not just Mother Earth. The traditional, the traditional appearance is as a partnership. The traditional appearance in many, many different cultures, and I talk about this through, through several chapters in my, in my work, is that over and over again, we find fertility partners. For the Sumerians, the most famous example was Inanna and Damuzi, who together engaged in this ecosexual uh, ritual that was taken as renewing the fertility of the earth every year or every generation. So it was a courtship between the, this masculine and this feminine, this goddess and this god, that were taken together as uh, renewing the earth. Now, there's been a lot of a lot of study of this, a lot of work of, on this. Um, certainly, Fraser's work focused on this a lot, but many others have as well. And what we find is that it's just really widespread tradition. So as I say here, the most ancient paramount deities, and what I mean by this is in the oldest examples, these are the big shots. It's not 
it's not Zeus on the throne originally. The most the, the paramount deities originally are these lovers who renew the earth. These were the big shots. And this was the fertility that renewed the world again and again. There's many different names. It's not always Demuzi, you know, we, and it's not always Anana. The names vary. Over here we have a portrait of Enki. Uh, and I track, I track many of these relations throughout the throughout the work. We also see later that this that this figure becomes, as I track through chapters, becomes Dionysus, who is very famous. And here is a quote from Walter F. Otto. Inherent in the Dionysiac element of moisture is not only the power which maintains life, but also the power which creates it. So we're talking about the nature of the green man here, this figure, the Demuzi figure. We have the we have the goddess of the soil, that's Inanna, and then we have on the other hand, the seminal waters, the god of the river, the god of the waters that brings life to the soil. Thus, it flows through the entire human and animal world as a fertilizing generative substance. The learned Greek Varro was very well informed when he declared that the sovereignty of Dionysus was not only to be recognized in the juice of fruits whose crowning glory was vine, but also in the sperms of living creatures. So what we're getting at here is this universal, just like the goddess's fertility is universal, we're also getting at a kind of seminal potency, a masculine principle that in many, many, many of these different traditions is also taken as universal in plants, in animals, in rivers. So now we're getting at what the green man is. He's this life-giving presence just like the goddess is in a different way. So this tradition was very persistent across many different places. Here we have a, a Minoan Crete seal around 1500 BC. This is a very famous seal. And we have the, we, we, don't, we don't know what the script says, so we can only make guesses about what this is. But we, again, we see the lions flanking the goddess, just like we see with Inanna, right? We have the lions on either side of Inanna. Here with the goddess of Crete, we have the lions again. And approaching her, we have this male figure, this godlike figure approaching her. We have Isis and Osiris in Egypt, which as, as we can see, and as, as I cover in my work, also have many of the same themes. Later on here, we have Venus, Aphrodite, and Adonis. This is a sculpture from later. But again, these, these two are another example that have many of the same themes, as I discuss in my work. Here's a quote from Herodotus, ancient. Ancient, ancient writer, ancient historian, the Egyptians do not all worship the same gods in common, except for Isis and Osiris, who they say is Dionysus. So again, just reinforcing that this is not a new idea, that these gods are the same, right? It's an old idea. Uh, Sir James Frazier made the same point of Aphrodite and Adonis in Syria, of Cybele and Addis in Phrygia, and of Isis and Osiris in Egypt. In every case, a human couple acted year by year the parts of the loving goddess and the dying god. We know that down to Roman times, Addis was personated by priests who bore his name. I also want to make the point that this, this tradition actually goes really deep spiritually. And we find evolving examples of this, this kind of union in other places as well. Um, I don't, I only touch on this sort of thing a little bit in the dissertation. I'd like to go more into this in subsequent work. On the left here, we have a traditional image from, from Hindu mysticism of the Shiv Shakti Puja. Half of this image, it's not just a god and a goddess separate, right? It's not just them together loving each other. It's a deeper joining too. And these, all of these images are part of that. Now, one might think that yin yang is something else, that it doesn't represent this. Um, I found it really interesting when I discovered that the Tibetan, the Tibetan word for what we might call the Shiv Shakti in India, the Tibetan word for it is Yad Yun, which certainly reminds me of Yin Yang. <laughs> and here's an image on the right of Yad Yun. There's an image of Yin Yang. Here's Shiv Shakti. So, um, of course, these traditions all have contact with each other. We could go a lot. We could study this a lot more. Skip that. So I also, this, you know, the eco-sexual tradition, this is also something that we see in the land, in the flourishing of the land and the abundance of the land. It's take, whenever, every time the land renews, becomes green and flowers, it's understood as being the joining 
of this god and this goddess. That's the traditional understanding. So here's a quote from Fraser that I really like. This is about a particular place in Cyprus, this river valley. It's very beautiful. This is a picture from a contemporary photo of this river valley. Fraser wrote, there is something delicious, almost intoxicating in the freshness of these tumbling waters, in the sweetness and purity of the mountain air, in the vivid green of vegetation. It was here that, according to the legend, Adonis met Aphrodite for the first or the last time, and here his mangled body was buried. In antiquity, the whole of the lovely veil appears to have been dedicated to Adonis and Aphrodite. So we've seen the return of the Mother Earth. A lot less work has gone into looking at this other question. What happened to the goddess's partner, the goddess's mate? So as I write in my work, notably the first campaign that Gilgamesh wages in his epic, the first war he wages, is actually not against the goddess first. The first campaign is against the already lost and confused and lonely incarnation of the ancient consort, who in the Epic of Gilgamesh is called Enkidu, which literally means son of Enki, which is one of the names of this, this ancient god. So the warlord first goes for him. Why? Because the, he is warned from prophecy, he's forewarned that there is a primal man still free in the wild, in the wilderness, and that that primal man will one day stand in the way of the warlords and his civilization's progress and power. So the first chapter of the epic is an involved scheme by Gilgamesh to sabotage and finally domesticate the primal man, Enkidu, and his natural strength. Enkidu is co-opted, as we see in this image, he's guarding, he's guarding Gilgamesh, he's helping Gilgamesh. And this eventually makes him so sick that he dies from it. That's my reading. So one finds a whole complex of these kinds of defeats and traumas and compromises in the post-Sumerian mythos of both the goddess and the green man. There have been many goddess feminists who've written about the goddesses uh, fracturing or fragmentation following, you know, in, under patriarchy. And what's interesting is we find a very interesting kind of parallel to that in her consort. He also fragments and compromises and is defeated and so on in different, in various ways at the same time. So goddess feminists have worked on that with her in some depth, working to mend that wound and restore honor to the, the goddess. So we've seen that Mother Earth has returned, but what of the fragmentation of her partner, the ecological masculine, as I call it? For many people, the word masculinity itself, the very idea of masculinity, is entirely trapped within the image of the warlord. That's the idea of what masculinity can be. It hasn't been reclaimed as anything else. So I want to take a little break here to look again at this question of the deep pluralism of myth and dream. So I'm going to note a few things here that I think are really important. First of all, what we can imagine both limits and opens what we can become, how we can relate and how we can participate. It is the boundary of what is possible for us. This is the pervasive influence of the mundus imaginalis, the imaginal world. We are never out of the influence of myth and dream. It is always here with us, defining what we can perceive and what we can become. And that is why to effectively control a people, all you have to do is control the range of the imaginal control what they can imagine. So what does it do to a society when the most accessible by far image of manhood or masculinity is the ecocidal and disconnected warlord? I write about this in the dissertation as well. And I wanna make one more point here, which is that participatory pluralism involves the insight that there is not only one path toward liberation. This isn't, none of this is a should. There's no shoulds in this, in this kind of participatory pluralism. Contrasting paths of genuine liberation are not competing, but harmonizing. So the deep freedom of a society may in fact be measurable 
by the accessibility of a diversity of paths of becoming. This is ecology, not monoculture. So to seek to open up the imagination is the goal, to open up new myths, not to define single myths and say, this is the way we have to be. The point is to open the imagination. So to imagine the green man. One motif that recurs again and again in the appearances of the green man is the foliate mask, which is a man's, it's, it's, a, it's an image that's probably familiar to all of us. It's a man's face pouring forth vegetation. Now this image comes from medieval church architecture, particularly a lot of these carvings come from the medieval period, but as we'll see, it didn't start there. The image suggests a fusion between the human mind and the universal life processes of the vegetal world. This becomes very important. Such a joining between the human mind and the universal life processes of the vegetal world again evokes the hieros gamos of the divine marriage between this goddess and this god. This traditional symbol of renewing the connection between mortal human society and consciousness and nature herself, nature, the bigger thing, which is also the goddess. It's related to that. So as we can see here, this kind of motif of the foliate mask, it didn't start with, it didn't start with the medieval church architecture. These are all images of classical figures from Greece and Rome and the Mediterranean that have come from before the medieval period, Okeanos, Dionysus, and Bacchus here. And these, these, these fusions of the, veget of the vegetal and the nature with the man's face go way back. And I do trace this in the dissertation as well, trace this, uh, this lineage. So a few different you know, ways of understanding the green man. Here's one, green man as partner to life. And these are all way, things that the green man has to teach us as well. So in contrast to modernity's obsession with the conquest and control of nature and death, control of death, there is the possibility of a willing and impassioned embrace of life. This is the option to accept mortality and willingly choose to fully join in to the unfolding beauty and evolution of the universal life process. Regardless of gender, this is surely an aspect of the ancient symbolism of hieros gamos or divine marriage. That is the joining of the human consciousness with the universal nature consciousness, the universal life process, which is also symbolized by vegetation, by the plant world. So I make a little, a little hypothesis here that perhaps the true wedding ring is simply one circle in this endless spiral. It's a generation, biological and otherwise, in the evolutionary continuance of life and renewal of cosmos. And this is an image that I discuss in the dissertation. And it's an image that can appear in many ways, but it's the spiral through life and time. It actually turns out to be a very old image, as we'll see. Here's another thing to note about the green man. We can also talk about the green man as the other king or the original king. So goddess reconstructionism has helped people to reconnect with ancient symbols of the ecological and divine, divine feminine. And as we have seen, the green man is a mythos with a parallel heritage, <clears throat> an image of life-giving masculinity that's far older than history itself. So this is an image of masculinity that's rooted not in dominion or domestication, but in creative partnership with the goddess and the ecology of life, the whole ecology, the whole community. So the meaning of kingship given here actually is older than patriarchy. It's older than warlords like Gilgamesh. Kingship is older. The original green king, as we might call him, was the partner to the goddess. He was a lover, a gardener, a bringer of abundance, and a wild animal of sorts whose indomitable and primal vitality infuses the whole community of life with freedom and strength. That's his quality. Not a conqueror. He's a bringer of vitality. Last way, last teaching here from the green man is that the green man's blessing is actually not an easy one. It's not about light. As we discussed at the beginning here, it's not about light. It's a strength, the strength that he exemplifies 
is the dynamic strength of life that grows and strives and dies. It's very down to earth. And in dying, life renews and evolves. Thus, alongside his partner, alongside the goddess, Anana, or so on, Ariadne, many names, he also is an ancient guide through the underworldly passage of life, through mortality's endless initiation, through strife, suffering, and death, pathos, drama. So we have some examples here. On the left, we have the ancient theater masks, which are also called the masks of Dionysus because they are the symbol of the god who is the patron of theater, among other things. And on the right, we have a very striking image, ancient image of young Bacchus, who has also been called the god who confronts. When we look at some of the panels of gods, we'll see all the other gods facing sideways, like they're in, they're in their dream world. And Dionys the face of Dionysus is the one face that, like this image, turns out of the mural to look directly at the viewer, to look you in the eye. And that has to do with, with what we're talking about here, this initiation. So when this initiation happens, it pierces the illusion of separation, which is also the illusion of that our individual death is, is final in a sense. Because what we're seeing, what we see through this death, when we see through the death in this way, we see that union that we've been discussing with the universal life process, that we're part of something much bigger. So this is not a metaphysical belief, it's a physical fact, right? As life forms, we are part of something much bigger. So we can recognize that logically, but experience experiential knowledge of this, this union, this joining, to know it with our whole selves, that's more rare. And this is what we might call, this is what the ancients called, I, I would say, ecstasis, which means standing outside the self, going beyond the small self. And here we have a whole mix of fascinating images that relate to this process, um, which is the process of life evolving through time. And we see two, uh, we again see in each of these images, at least in most of them, we see the the two sides, the goddess and the god, the masculine and the feminine. This is very ancient and very cross-cultural, as we can see in yoga, in Egypt, in Egyptian mythos. And uh, some of these are a couple of modern paintings that, again, are showing the same kind of process of awakening collectively and personally. It's very deep, it's very deep mythos, very deep mysticism in this tradition. And there's here's some more examples of the same thing. We have the double helix of DNA, which is incredibly just about the same shape as these ancient symbols. <laughs> the staff, the, the caduceus, the staff of the hermetic staff here, symbol of knowledge and healing in the middle above. We have both Shiva and Dionysus here. And the parallels are incredible. Note that they're both on large cats. Note that note the, the, the staves they both have, staves, the serpents or ribbon imagery, the long hair. Very interesting stuff. And all of these symbols are part of the part of the mysticism. All right, the question of reconnection. What restores connection between human consciousness and the universal life process? Such healing can't really come from top-down systems or authoritative knowledge. For these kind of top-down systems, reinforce the attitude of the mind that knows, which suppresses the emergent creativity of wilderness which is the same, which is the original wound. That's the wound in the first place, that control. Wilderness, again, is precisely the organic intelligence that exceeds the modern mind's project of control. And this includes the wild earth, the wild body and the wild dream. All of these are ways in to wilderness itself, bigger wilderness, the energy of wilderness, the fact of wilderness. We have here the mycelial web, the web beneath the soil, which is the that emergent that emergent wilderness. That's also the hidden wilderness. So we have here reconnecting with the wild earth. I made the note here: visiting nature is not enough. First of all, we are nature, and secondly, 
the music of the earth, the nature I'm talking about, is typically felt as alien to the modern mind. So it requires immersion, like learning a new language. It's not something you can visit like a tourist. It has to be a deeper immersion if we want to actually reconnect with wilderness itself, the wilderness around us and inside us, the ecology. So here's a few images. Here we have an artistic rendering of the subterranean mushroom spirit, which I actually write about in my dissertation as a spirit. <laughs> um, I write about several entheogenic experiences in my dissertation as well. It's part of what I talk about as well. And this probably comes from that too. This is, I don't know who, who painted this, but, it, but I found it on uh, Paul Stamets' webpage. Uh, my entheogenic mycologist. This is an image of me um, out in Parvati Valley in Himachal Pradesh in the mountains in the Himalayas. Uh, that was very beautiful there. And this is also an image my father sent me a few days ago. I said this is him similarly gripped by the spirit of the green man. This was taken very recently. <laughs> my dad is here today and I included him there. Julian, you, you have about five minutes or so more to, uh, okay. to conclude. Got it. All right. Um, yeah, I'm pretty close. So reconnecting with the wild body was the next point here. And I, I showed a few examples of this. I showed that, that the, the ecstatic dancing as a deep form of connection is actually part of this ancient tradition. Here's a, here's a motif of the ancient Dionysian wilderness dance revelries. I had included here, we actually have the, uh, the, one of the founders of Bay Area Ecstatic Dance is here, is here with us today as well, which is very cool. Here's an image of um, contemporary ecstatic dance, which has been really making a renaissance these last decades, which is amazing, I think. And here on the right, we have another way of looking at the wild body, which is this is a map of the yogic nadis of the subtle body, the channel which are taken as the the rivers of energy in the body. So the wilderness runs deep in the body. And I included this image of ayahuasca visions by the Peruvian artist Pablo Amaringo. This, this work with psychedelics that's happening now in culture, I see as being um, one of the most promising avenues, very powerful potential avenue for the collective work of reconnecting with that wild dreaming soul, learning to see it and take it seriously again as a deep reality, a deep part of reality. So a couple notes here on, I'll skip the alchemical stuff, but I'll go here to, to a note here, which is that this has to do with, with the work in the world. I, I noted that that the, we have these examples of gods fighting against monsters, <laughs> against giants. And it's interesting that the world destroying forces in these cases become giant, but the gods don't. And the, the, what, I, what I'm noting here is that the path forward for those wanting to do good work in the world may not be to try to become giant to try to scale. Rather, what I note is that what makes gods gods, in my view, is that they are very densely themselves. They're very layered with their form of consciousness, purified, interwoven with their, with the, with their own nature of soul. The power of dreams or soul is not a matter of size or tactics so much as a density of being. And the ancient Greek saying, know thyself. Alchemical purification. When I think of the green man, I think of the roots that break through concrete, even in city centers. I think of the original bull dancers, such as those depicted in the art of Minoan Crete, who went naked and weaponless to leap with the wild bulls. Unconditional aesthetic participation is my term for this kind of consciousness, which emerges through proper death initiation and to revitalize life. Through this, one's unique expression becomes unconditional, just as the growth of plants is unconditional. They don't, they don't hesitate. 
as one passes through death to perceive union with the universal process of life. The green man is, in my view, partly an image of mortal consciousness fusing with this ever dying, undying, and therefore ecstatic music of life. That makes it very powerful, I believe. As Walter F. Otto says, from these depths comes music, Dionysiac music, which transforms the world in which life had become a habit and a certainty and death a threatening evil. This world it obliterates with the melody of the uncommon, which mocks all attempts at reassurance. And here we have that, that essence of the green man, comedy and tragedy, which is both undefeatable hope and complete surrender to the trauma or the drama, the tragedy of life too. There's no reassurance, there's no falsehood, but there's also no hesitation, there's no holding back. And with uncommon music, surely comes uncommon dancing. Here's a few images of the God that's green and dancing. On the left, we have Shiva Nataraja, who's the Lord of the cosmic dance. In the middle, we have an ancient image of the Maenad, the, the ecstatic priestess of Dionysus and her dance. And on the right, this is a, a digital art that I made from a couple of years ago of my reaction to seeing the, the mural of Mahakali dancing on top of Shiva's body as he surrenders. And this is another part of that divine union as well, a union of fertility, another way of looking at it, another moment in it. Such profound insights, far from primitive, have long suffused the mysticism of traditional and ancient people including modernity's own ancestors. Such traditions may yet have much to teach us today. Thus, in the spirit of epistrophic therapia, it has been my honor to introduce When God Was Green and Dancing, a Hillmanian regeneration of the ecological masculine at the roots of modernity. Thank you very much for coming. Okay, very good. Thank you so far, Julian. Um, we'll have some time for comment and question with the committee. And um, I want to, typically I like to open with our external member, Renee. forgive me that today we'll go with Craig first because he has uh, a more hard timeline uh, to follow. So we get Craig's comments as well. Then we'll go with you next, if that's okay. Okay, well, Craig. Thanks so much. And sorry, sorry, Renee, I've got a medical appointment that I can't break. So um, Julian, uh, that was brilliant, as is your work. And um, I'm so happy to be have been a part of all of this. Right from the start, you and me were in class talking about this connection between nature and archetype, and then it went in this direction of honoring the masculine dimension of things. And uh, I just so much appreciate your work on so many levels. So I just wanted you to know that. And um, when you mentioned that Hillman's been gone for more than a decade, I, it startled me because it, it felt like I was just talking to him yesterday almost. And so I'm raising him because I think he would have greatly appreciated what you just presented. So with that in mind, my question is a Hillmanian question. So James Hillman talked a lot about um, what he called the naturalistic fallacy. And Hillman being Hillman, he was a little bit snarky about it. He said things like, you know, we can't just reconnect with nature like by wearing earth shoes and eating cottage cheese, you know, and going out for hikes and stuff like that. And he, he seemed to think that that was a form of literalism. And a lot of what we call environmentalism and ecology, likewise, he would have thought as being fairly literalistic of the psychic reality of nature. And so it seems to me that your work um, through archetype, through um, recovering the divine masculine in nature actually does speak to reconnecting with the natural world on a lot of levels. And so 
My question is, how would you reply to Hillman's piece about the naturalistic fallacy? I mean, I, I definitely understand where what Hillman's saying there, and I agree with him. Um, you know, I used to hate living in cities um, because they felt, I felt like I was suffocating um, from the lack of nature. And during my time in India, I ended up being locked down in Delhi during COVID lockdown for three months. And in fact, I couldn't even, I was actually had to stay in my apartment and um, stay away from the windows for one month because there was fear of foreigners for a while. Mm. Um, and those three months ended up being a meditation in, I ended up feeling very peaceful. And, um, and I got over my aversion to cities. Now I feel quite comfortable in cities as well. And what I, you know, what I came to realize is that the idea that nature is something out there is just completely false. If we're breathing, we're in nature, you know? Um, our, being in our bodies, we're in nature. Being around, being with oxygen, being with the trees growing around, even in cities, and the bird, the, 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 the crows and the, and the animals and the bacteria and everything. So, so nature is, it, 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 the truth is that it's, I, I, as I see it, is that it, truth, reconnecting with nature has nothing to do really with going into, going into the mountains. You can, you, can, you can go into your backyard if you have one or your potted plant or just go into your own cells. And, and reconnecting with nature is really a matter of open, opening, one's, opening oneself to it's, it's omnipresent. It's always suffusing reality. There's no separation. But um, that being said, uh, it can, I think nature out there can be very palatable <laughs> and can, can really draw people out of their, their shells, their alienation, and make them want to, you know, you want to connect with the nature of a beautiful waterfall in Greece <laughs> and Cyprus. You want to connect with that nature. Um, and so that draw, I think that it's very helpful when people do have an aversion to get them into the wilderness, give them the space and the quiet and the desire to open in that way. Yeah, very well put. Thank you, Julian. I, one of the last times I talked to him and he was ranting about <clears throat> how we tend to make city bad and nature good. And he saw that as a psychic split. And I asked him, well, what do you recommend? Are you against reconnecting with nature? And he said, no, let's bring nature into the city. So I think that aligns well with what you just said. So that's all. That's the only question I had. So thanks, Julian. Thank you, Craig. Appreciate it. Does that mean I can ask a question? Yes, Renee, Renee, come on in. I saw you're unmuting. Just yeah, go right ahead. I yes, yes. My, my heater is not too loud. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I want to echo Craig's uh, reflection of your brilliance. And um, what struck me today about the image of the green man is his mouth is open and the leaves appear to be coming out of his mouth. And interestingly, I just read a chapter from Hillman yesterday in the book, The Rag and Bone Chop of the Heart yesterday, about words and about beautiful language. And I just want to say for the men who are here, who are mostly writers and creative, like verbalizing, whatever that is, like with the green energy of the green man also has a creative component for men that has to do with expression. And so I guess my question was, yeah, there's dancing as part of the healing. But I'm very interested in men healing uh, because it's such a core component of ecological belonging and the wounded masculine. And, um, you know, I know that this is going to be a lifetime exploration for you, but there's something about men with men working together. There's something about the healing of Gilgamesh and his wild self um, that is just such an important part of our and how women you know, the, the, the image of the women, the feminine being like the throne, like the container for the masculine that is born, like it dies and is reborn. Um, also, like how do we step into that role to support? I'm a, I'm a mother of sons. And so 
I'm very interested in how do we support the healing of the masculine. And um, yeah, and it, interestingly, this is in a book where Hillman works with Michael Mead and Robert Blythe, who found the men's movement. And so even though that might have gone somewhat underground more recently, I think that there's still more work to be done in that area. And so I'm wondering, you know, because there's a lot of images of the dancing with the goddess, which I think is great, but I also wonder about the dancing of the masculine within its own healing process and how that lives, how that's living in your life now, including the expression, like clearly writing is a big part of your, how you channel this energy, which is like, wow, here it is. But the other part is, and I don't think it's in the myth quite yet. It's like an, myth, an emerging part of the myth. Like that we have roots in our history we can look to, but there's something about the myth has a future that's like you had said, it's sort of the uncommon tomb that it's not yet, it hasn't yet emerged. We can't only look to the past for this particular thing. Anyway, I wonder how that lives in you. In your somewhat solitary life, which I can relate to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, some, I mean, some of those things that have to do with expression. And if you recall, uh, in, in the second chapter of my work, I, I talk about the um, logos. And the, the, one of the quotes is, the green man uttering the logos as foliage. And this also gets at the nature of what mythopoetics are, right? And what, and this is partly that's in the chapter where I'm talking about what knowledge is, and the recognition that knowledge is not some abstract thing. True knowledge, the green man's knowledge, is not some abstract thing living in a book somewhere. It's relational, and it's alive, and it's a it's an act of generosity. It's an act of giving life, and that's the. That's knowledge. Knowledge is speech that blesses, that blesses life. That's the only knowledge worth having in this perspective. It's not something you have, it's something that you are, that you do with your life, that you're a part of. Um, so I do I am trying to surrender to that and live into that with my life. Yes. Um, and part of my process with that has also has not just been writing, but it's also true that during this last few years, there's been a lot for me with the voice. And I in in India, I ended up becoming a bhajan and kirtan singer, as well as a harmonium player. So singing singing my prayers in that way, and with both Hindu, and then also I went back to various. I've gone back to this various, you know, American rock songs and Jewish American lyricists like Leonard Cohen and turning their work into my own version of bhajan, you know, which is again, fusing, fusing all these traditions together in my own life as I work to open, open the logos from in myself. And the other part of your question is a question of my work in the world and, and service. And that's the next chapter for me. And um, it's a big question. But that's really the next thing for me to turn to in many ways. Um, so let's let's chat about that as it unfolds, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to um, honor uh, your work, the re-belonging ourselves to the mythology that freeing our imagination to what's possible for humanity is so important today. And a reimagining of the masculine is such a big part of that. So just, I feel very deeply nourished and hopeful having read your, and absorbed and been enveloped by your work recently. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Very good. Uh, Julian, yes, um, we've been in conversation uh, throughout uh, this writing process. And, um, you know, I think it, you're, you're proposing uh, something really important, echoing what Renee and, and Craig said here already. Uh, I think your work is brilliant. It's beautifully written also. I recommend to anybody here to, uh, once it's out, to get a, cop uh, um, um, a copy 
and enjoy also the journey uh, with you in a literary sense. Um, this dual aim in a way of uh, reaffirming imagination as a way of knowing, as a way of being in the world, as well as the uh, recovering, reconstructing, uh, reimagining the masculine in particular as sort of the, the dual aims of, of your work. And I want to ask you a question, maybe furthering on what Rene just brought up. Where, where do you see this work evolving, even if you uh, haven't, uh, you know, thought that all the way through? I'd uh, like to hear where you where you stand, how you think about it now. What is the work, you know, individually, collectively, for men, uh, for the larger culture, in order to uh, re-embrace some of this sort of the wild and 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 fertile and life-giving and uh, uh, creative uh, union-oriented masculine that you're recovering here. What's the work that has to be done or that can be done uh, individually and collectively? What, what can you envision for that? And so that's part A and, and B of my question is, what do you see as pitfalls or or shadows uh, in doing that work uh, as, as, you know, I don't know, potential ways of, of bypassing or, 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 or blindness uh, 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 circumvention of, of sorts in, in doing this work? Yeah, those are, wow, those are great questions, honestly. Um, well, as far as as far as men go, and I think I think the men you can see looking at the men's movement as it's as as Renee was talking about as well. Um, that's that's unfolded so far. I think we can see some of this already. Some of what you're asking, both where the work is and also where it's going to get where it gets problematic and it's going to continue getting problematic. Um, which is that to say that it seems clear to me. So we, as we ground into our own bodies, as we ground into our own voices, as we ground into our own experience in this life, dancing, being in wilderness, being fathers, being uh, physical beings, all instinctual beings, intuitive beings, having our own beauty to express. You know, I think that's because th this is where a lot of, this is where, where a lot of us are stuck, I think is that we don't feel that. We feel, with, especially without this um, mythos, having forgotten a, a life-giving, having forgotten the life-giving masculine mythos, we're left uh, adrift. And if we want to be life-giving, what can we do? Well, many of us have to, in some way, try to grab on to the raft of life, the life-giving feminine, the life-giving women, whether that means grabbing on to those women in our lives and looking for them to validate or give us meaning, or alternatively may mean to embrace, try to embrace those aspects of ourselves. And there's, of course, that's good. But for that to be the only way for us to feel life-giving, were to, for us to equate our own feminine qualities as life-giving and our masculine qualities as destructive, obviously is putting our putting masculinity in a big shadow, <laughs> huge shadow. So, so this rooting into the wild, animal, natural, intuitive, mad of course i talk about madness the dionysian madness all of these aspects of the masculine beauty crazy masculine beauty with everything that it is and of course the folks like robert bly and so and have done have done a lot with this so i, I do think that i do think that we need to do that work and that i just don't see any way around that because i don't see how we can even begin to be a full part of the conversation and move forward in a 
sense of you know being in a circle together, being in community together, women and men, all people. I don't see how men can do that in a real way until we are doing that with all of ourselves embraced. Otherwise, what is it? It's uh, it's not sustainable. We have to be everything we are to even st for that to even really start to move forward. That seems clear to me. Now, saying that, it does, does it immediately brings up the next part of your question, which is, which is, how can we possibly do that without being very destructive in the process? Um, because there's no doubt that a lot of these instincts and a lot of this wildness, first of all, even even if it's uh, probably even in its most holistic and natural form, it's scary. It's kind of scary. Hunters are scary. Big, big men are scary. And secondly, it's not in its most natural and healthy form. <laughs> it's been all kinds of all kinds of twisted up, both from being, both from committing violence and from having violence committed to it. So so the fact, so there's no, there's no not messy way to do this. There's no not messy way to do this. Um, it's going to be that healing. I think the only path forward with that healing is a path of um, sincerity and willingness to be human together and proceed with authenticity uh, as we connect into who we are and give ourselves and each other more and more permission to open to what, what we really are. And this this work this work is not an answer to that. It's part of that process. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I like the way you, the way you think about it, and honor also the the difficulty or maybe the confusion even on how to do that, uh, on how even for you know men and I work with a lot of men as a therapist also to reengage with something of that nature without falling into the uh, the very thing that they're trying to overcome, uh, but also uh, without um, forgetting something that is that can be very vital and li and life giving. Um, and I like how you honor actually the sort of the not knowing how to do that after uh, centuries and millennia of uh, something very different being culturally, uh, um, emphasized and and uh, passed on but my only follow-up question for you is what do you hope that this work will do in this sort of larger work that you're proposing where do you how do you hope how do you think uh, your writing and uh, what you're hoping to do with it uh, uh, what it can turn potentially into where do you see it flowering Life giving in its in its impact. What is what's your sense of where this could go? I think I'm trying to give dignity to some things that I think are um, have had dignity stripped from them, and that um, are not just per not they are important. Some of many of these things are personally important, and I felt I felt the pain of that dignity being stripped from them. Whether we're talking about imagination or masculinity, these are two two things: dreams, nature, life, vitality. All these things have had dignity stripped from them. And I guess um, the the only the only way that I can see us moving forward collectively at this point is to get in touch with the sensitive soulfulness that is part of our human nature. Um, you know, the, the, the way I see it as I walk around this world, all, all humans are born with sensitive souls and sensitive hearts and care. We're all born that we're all born with that. And it's become in modern world, it's become very cool to, to not to be very callous and to not to really not um, not care about imagination, not care about nature, 
not care about our own souls. Um, and I just think if that's the kind of ma ma cheap kind of cheapening materialism that we're living in, if if we've bought into that together, we don't have examples of what it looks like to be to be living and caring soulfully, to be living a soulful existence with, with and it has to be with power. Because otherwise it's not, otherwise it's not, it's going to be, it's not taken seriously. So if we don't even have examples of that, and that's what I see is most people don't even have examples of what it looks like to live life sincerely with beauty. And if we don't have that, why, why should we even begin to take care of the natural world or not proliferate nuclear weapons or anything else? So we, I, I just think everything begins with having a care for the poetry of life, a real deep care for it. Um, and more, th more than anything else, I just think that's what we need to, we need to do that in every dimension, help all different kinds of people to reconnect with the way that they connect to care. And so I'm, I'm working with the dimensions or the, the, the portions of the human collective that are most connected to me in that way, to help them remember their dignity and also remember the, the larger dignity and importance in a sense, the beauty of life. To become stewards, to be stewards. Very good, thank you. Renee, did you have a, another follow-up comment or question? Yeah, I just wanna honor that your father is here um, and that we also had a younger member of your family here looking at us through the photograph, but just, the, those who've known you a long time are part of your journey. I just wanted to honor their presence. I think that's lovely. And um, in my work, I'll often say it's beneath our dignity to destroy our living home. So yet yeah, restoring dignity seems to be a huge part of our, our healing work. Um, because there's so much accountability work to be done without dignity first, it's going to be just a form of punishment to ourselves and each other. And that, that's not what we need anymore. So really appreciate your, your emphasis of dignity. And I love the image of your father. <laughs> with the, it must be quite um, an amazing journey for you to have been the father of, 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 of Julian and watching his journey. So thank you for being here. It's, I think you know fathers are a big part of, of men's work and the lineage of fathers. So. My father has been extra an extraordinary ally and uh, a predecessor to me in many ways. And I, 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 def I deeply honor him. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Julian. Uh, Renee and I will go to a breakout room to discuss. I have Craig's comments that he sent to me in writing um, to take into consideration. And while we're gone, the audience can ask some questions, comments, uh, be in conversation with you for a few minutes, and uh, then we'll come back. Uh, Steph, are you there? Oh, yes, he's, he's setting up a room for us. So, Renee, if you follow the link, I'll see you there. I can go first. Hello. Hi, Dad. Hi. Um, beautiful talk. Very well done. Um, very, very clear. A um, couple things came to mind, just a couple comments. One is, um, as you were speaking about the, um, the alienation, I thought of a book that maybe was influential for you. It was influential for me. I think I introduced it to you when, I, when you were still uh, very young. Uh, Ishmael is Daniel Quinn. That's right. um, yeah, uh, and uh, just wonder if had any any uh, comments on that, and um, and the other comment I'll, I'll make is um, uh, something we haven't really talked about too much. Um, I guess I don't think about it as much as I should. Um, but when I was reintroduced or introduced to Judaism in the way that I've learned to do it as an adult, um, one of the concepts that's um, brought in a lot is the Shekinah, 
and especially around Shabbat, uh, as you were talking about the partnership and uh, the concept of seeing Shabbat, which is, I think, very a very common, very old image in Judaism as a time to uh, welcome in the Shekinah, the indwelling spirit, and the as a as a marriage between the the masculine um, trans transcendental God and the indwelling spirit, um, the Shekinah. So, just any comments on those two things? Um, regarding the first, I I do actually mention Ishmael in in this my second chapter as part of my the story of how I came into this work. Um, Yes, reading Ishmael was, and I'm, I think I read that when I was probably 13 or 14 years old. And it was a major awakening for me. Um, and that reading that book for me was a turning point from my feeling that uh, I had an intuitive feeling that I didn't know how to place, that things were in some way not right with the world, with society with my family, I didn't, with myself, um, there was an intuitive feeling that there was really something off. And I, and when I read Ishmael, it didn't only validate that feeling, it gave me a historical context and a, a civilization-wide context to understand that I wasn't just, um, I wasn't just imagining things. Um, uh, the the difficulty of Ishmael, and I don't think it's a word, I don't think it's a difficulty that Daniel Quinn ever ever really he tries to address it, I think, subsequently, but I don't think he ever really succeeds, is trying to find a hopeful direction. Um, I don't think he succeeds at that. And I think we have to go deeper than history in order to find a hopeful direction. I think that's why we need to turn toward imagination in a sense, toward magic which is where we find the possibilities of radical transmutation, which is possible, it happens, um, but we have to go deeper for that. Um, regarding the second question, that's a, that's a very interesting question. And, um, and I, haven't, I honestly haven't studied the Shekinah tradition well enough to be able to speak about it. Um, what what I would immediately kind of be with these with these when when these traditions show up in um, in traditions that have strong kind of like monotheistic patri you know patriarch figures, then when consort goddesses are there, they are often there's a compromise that happens where they're put into secondary roles. And in many ways, that seems more insulting to me than just not having them there at all. Because <laughs> it's not, they're definitely not secondary in the traditions I'm talking about. It's a full partnership. And if it, you know, sometimes the god seems bigger, sometimes the green man seems bigger. I mean, and often the goddess seems like the bigger figure, you know, quite often. So there's no, there's no, it's not a, it's not a secondary goddess, that's for sure. And I'm not sure if we looked at the Shekinah tradition, what, what we'd find in terms of that question. Anyone else? Hello, I have a question. No doubt, soon to be Dr. Michaels. Thank you for your work. Um, one quick reference, which is I've been really looking into this. I thought you might like a book called When God Had a Wife, if you haven't read it already. Um, and there's also a few books that detail the connections between the Shahina, Sophia, and um, Ishtar traditions as well. So I think that's called the Cosmic Shekinah. But that's not what I was wanting to ask you about. Um, unironically, I had a nightmare last night that I was being chased by a giant patriarch-like figure and ran into a cave. Um, and when I, upon waking, I was like, oh, damn it, Lily, you could have like turned toward, like, how often do you get to confront a giant, like, the, the what I thought might be the patriarchy or Saturn or otherwise so I was really like sitting with myself and being like dang it I wish I'd been able to turn toward that that psychic figure in my dream and 
I'm kind of wondering if you wouldn't mind saying a little bit more about the connection between overcoming the death drive or the fear of death, which it sounds like in your work, you're really talking about this original confrontation is a confrontation with the reality of death and dominion over not only the men themselves, but over nature, over all forms of life has to do with kind of a fundamental denial or fighting with death. And then toward the end of your work, you really speak about aesthetics as being a way of, of being with that. So I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind giving just a little bit more, which I'm sure you do in your dissertation, and talking about how aesthetic perception and or action can be a way of working with or toward or for the de this drive toward um, overcoming death or even working with death. Mm. For me, it's been the other way around. Um, the, the aesthetics have blossomed through the death encounter. It, it wasn't the guide for it. It was on the other side, um, which maybe says something about uh, decomposition and fertility. Um, so, I, I and I certain I don't think there's a there's a I don't think there's a um, really a medicine for the to to, to remove the terror. Um, that's that is that's part of the show. <laughs> um, what 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 allowed me to I mean a big part of what allowed me to keep going was. Um, I mean, partly it was being driven into the nightmare work from, from a young age. And then I ended up with this compulsion to keep going and keeps trying to get to the root of that. And I ended up doing really intense entheogenic ceremony work for a couple of years. It was often very, very difficult work. Um, and I, and I would pace myself too. You just not, you know, a lot of, some people try to throw themselves at these things without just like abandon, right? Just over and over again. But I don't think that's the way it's with, you should do it with integration. Integration, right? They're kind of pacing, but, um, but that can be very powerful. Uh, it takes time to work through, work through this stuff. And it's not, you know, I don't think trying to like keep, keep my, I mean, you can turn around and face the thing if you want, but trying to, um, there's no shame in being scared. There's no shame in running, and there's no rush. If this is a, it's a process of years to keep working with, with this. Um, I I think the the um, yeah. For, I guess the the liberation from that fear starts for me when um when first of all it's a lot of it is just getting comfortable with the terror and the getting used to it facing it enough that you just that you, you know you just kind of settle with it a lot of people avoid just avoid that their whole lives um, but if you want to move through that as the greek as the ancient greeks said die before you die you know and then the other part is, is that spiritual expansion of recognizing that, um, that I'm part of something, I'm part of much larger processes. This, this particular body, this particular mind, this particular experience, you know, at a certain point, I'm, you know, Julian is just a, just a, just a thing moving through this moment. <laughs> it's just a name, a name for this, this constellation of energy in this moment. And I'm just as much my father and I'm just as much my grandfather and grandmother and mother and, and ancestry and my, and my descendants and plant life and the air that I breathe and all of that. So there's nothing, you know, that's the recognition that nothing really dies, just changes. But that doesn't change, that doesn't evaporate the terror. No, that doesn't evaporate the terror either. I do write about it a lot in the book in the, in the work and particularly about moving through that process then then this huge a lot of energy becomes available that's the aesthetic blossoming 
when it when it doesn't when when it's when you don't need the protect the protection anymore, then all of that energy that was being used for that protection from the from the from that awareness, all that energy becomes liberated. And then it's like, well, what do I want to do? I can do anything. Hey, Julian, I'll jump in if that's all right. Hey, Luke. Nice hey, to see you, brother. Good to see you, too. It's been several years now since I met you at dance in Eugene and continue to find healing there and uh, the green man there. Um, I think I appreciate your presentation a lot. I think it's very important information to share with people and uh, definitely male, male people. Um, it gives me a story you know, something, a, a way of finding liberation from the more painful controlling stories. So I do hope that this information will just con continue to be spread. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, something like listening to your presentation that comes up in my life has been anxiety. And I think in, in many ways that anxiety is actually the wildness coming back in. And the only problem is my shame around it and being able to reframe it with that in mind is i think key and something i continue to work on um my question though is actually like very basic i i would like to just understand uh what the, the feminine really is is that the world of form and why is the the green man like separate to begin with why can't this this feminine goddess just do her thing herself and, if you don't mind. Well, um, some some of the the goddess feminists think that she should. <laughs> that's in that's in the work sometimes. That um, that the that's one story is that the the male is secondary, kind of accidental, a later evolution, an outsider. And um, and that uh, you know that the original thing is is basically just the feminine. Uh, there's a word. There's a word in, in some some of the work parthenogenetrix, which means the self self begetting feminine, the self birthing feminine. So, um, but you know when I so in in my work I looked at history. I looked at the oldest re records, the oldest recorded example of human culture, the oldest recorded myths. And as far as going back, as far as we can read, as far as we can study history, the figures are a partnership. From the very beginning of history, the very beginning of what we can read about, it's it's a it's a two dancing together, two threads. Um, if if we so so that that's that's what I can root in is the fact that that's cross cultural, and that that is I'm not going to say universal, but widespread. That's the rule, is that it's an equal partnership. Um, the other part of the question that you kind of posed here is has to do with what is the nature of the feminine, and I think probably by core, I, that, as I as I talked about it when I was giving the presentation, that's something I would have liked to say more about. But due to time constraints, I focused on the green man, um, and that's also because I, I do I do talk about the nature of the goddess in my work because I you know I have to. If I'm going to talk about the nature of the green man, um, but I recognize that that I'm I'm also I'm entering into this work as as a partner in a sense, an intellectual partner to the goddess feminists who have made their specialty the the goddess. Um, what I can say is looking at these ancient traditions. From what I can tell, the oldest form of the differentiation is what I would call ecological or ecosexual. So the oldest differentiation is not a philosophical differentiation between 
what we might call mattering consciousness, which is what some of the later traditions express it as. That's not really how it looks in the oldest tradition. It's much more down to earth. It's the relationship between the soil and the fresh water. That's the symbol. The goddess is the soil. That's also why she's called the mountain. She's the mountain goddess from very, very old traditions because she's that substantial soil or rock, the earth. And the god is the wellspring. He bubbles up from beneath the earth as liquid, infusing the rivers. And those rivers, where they touch the soil, that's where the forest springs. And so in this very early imagery, you can already see the beginnings of that dancing quality that is in him. That, that vine-like quality, which is also like a serpent-like quality of the river, the, the, this guy, right? He's got this move, right? And that's, how he, that's what he's doing. And everywhere he's touching the, the goddess where the two of them meet, which is the, if you remember that quote I read about the, from that, from that glen, from that river, that waterfall glen with the greenery, right? That quote, it's because that's where, that's the famous, that's very famous. The riversides are very famous for the two of them. Because where the soil and the water meet, that's where life happens. And then we, and then that's the that's the original kind of ecological thing. But of course, that's just the surface symbol. We take it deeper, and we see the deeper the deeper symbolism of what what this dance is that's happening in all of us in all of our lives. We are a meeting of the the soil and the water on, on, in a different way. Can you say what is the soil and what is the water a metaphor for? I think you already said something like earth and the world and consciousness is that is that what you said or? no not oh, not exactly well you can't really say what it is a metaphor i mean it's not a metaphor <laughs> it's it's that's what they are originally they are the soil and the water and they are more um in this in this type of work and this is again this is coming from Hillman again if you recall this principle of non-literalism so i'm never going to say what these symbols mean is this because mm -hmm. that's not what they are it's a body of poetry that all relates to each other. So they are the river and the soil. They are also the, the semen and the seed and the womb, the egg within animals, right? And we can get more spiritual. We can, so this is where you start getting into this idea of like matter and, and spirit, but it's not really matter and spirit. It's more like the yin, maybe closer to like the yin and the yang, which is like, it's a cosmic principle of something substantial, something with inertia, something with solidness, and a cosmic principle of something that's, that's pushing it or that's moving, that's dancing it. And these two things are kind of playing together. Um, there's a lot of places. There's, there's like the goddess also as, as Lily um, was commenting it is also Sophia. Sophia is wisdom. Sophia means wisdom. And that's one of the names of the goddess in some of the traditions. And this is, can also be talked about as because the, the soil or the substantiality of the world is what, holds, is what holds the wisdom of kind of the way the world works, right? It's, it's, it, has that, it has that knowledge. Whereas the, 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 the God is also talked about as the God of madness, the Lord of madness, insane. He's also, the, he's also frequently a patron of artists, right? Um, inspired genius, and madness, because he thinks he thinks you can break all the rules, because he because that's because he because he, he's all he's all inspiration, he's all possibility, the new possibility movement, and so again, where these two things meet, you have you have the you know the, the substantiality of the world, and you have new possibility, and that's like the whole dance, isn't it? That's part of our lives too. So these are all layers. They're all metaphors for each other. Thanks, Julian. That does speak to my question. That helps. Thank you. Hello, Julian. This is uh, amazing, amazing work. I'm very grateful to you for, for embarking on this and for sharing it with us. Um, uh, <laughs> one question that's coming up for me is. Um, one of the areas that I've been really interested in is in, in the, the uh, Western myth of the Grail. 
that the sort of romance of the masculine and feminine um, sort of embodied in this, in the, uh, in the uh, concept of chivalry. And I know it's very embedded in a patriarchal system, and yet there seems to be um, this relationship where the, where the, as I understand anyway, where the physical, um, the thing that, that, uh, that the masculine desires is, is embodied in a physical, but it's, but it's pointing to, or it's representing something that's ideal. That's, you know, and I'm wondering, um, and that it's in service to that, to that, both the, the, the embodiment of the larger, I, I don't even know what to, I don't like the word ideal, but for lack of a better word. So I'm wondering where that, where that fits in, if anywhere and how, how, what we might learn from that in terms of moving forward in that kind of erotic relationship. So, um, I, I also love the, the grail romances, and, um, and I do talk about them in my work. There, there's a book that um, you, if you haven't seen it yet, by um, Jesse Weston, from 100 years ago now, called From Ritual to Romance. And um, she, so I, I, do, I do cite her in my work a fair amount uh, on this topic because she directly traces the grail tradition. Of course, the, of course the grail tradition is influenced by the Christian tradition. As, and as you say, there's patriarchal influences there in the later tradition, but its original sources are really, you can't really root them there. Its original sources are older, and they are pagan and earth-based. And even more specifically, as Weston, as Weston would say, they're basically what I would call Dionysian. We're talking about the fertility. So you're, I think you're exactly right to draw the. I, I think you're draw, I think you're drawing that link, and I think you're exactly right to do so. That, that that they are essentially a later expression of this original Hieros Gamos um, uh, mythos. Yes, they are fertility ritual. Yes. Um, so as far as the second part of your question goes, um, well, I would broaden that. And I would say that that's the spiritual dimension of life for all of us. That every, I mean, it, that's something that each of us either can, either does or doesn't get in touch with. <laughs> and Hillman, Hillman would, would like this in his own way, right? Because it's, it's taking everything non-literally. It's taking, it's going really deep into the non-literalism and recognizing that our whole existence, if we want to go this way, we want to take this path, that all of our experiences, our whole existences are essentially metaphors for a consciousness process, for a spiritual process, a journey that we're on, right? And that everything that's happening for us literally is part of that journey. So if we want to just talk about relationships, yeah, we can definitely... We can definitely choose to relate to our romantic relations and our erotic relationships in that way. Both women and men can choose to relate to them that way. Um, and, I, and yes, I, I see what you're pointing to with the, with, the, with the idea of chivalry and the grail romances. And I do think that's exactly what they are trying to point to, yes, is that, that the, the erotic or personal love, I think, and I think the, Sufi, the Sufis would certainly love this too, right? You know, Rumi would Rumi likes this, right? That it just becomes a doorway into the refinement of love itself, which is a very high calling. If we can, if we can allow that refinement to happen, then we're on a spiritual journey, and the romance just becomes a, an avenue for that, a way into that. To become a great lover is to become a saint. Hi, I almost said welcome back, but we're the ones coming back. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So we had a very fruitful and uh, enlivened conversation about uh, your work and, and reaffirming that we really feel it's a, it's a, a, a beautiful and important contribution. Uh, timely, uh, poetic, powerful uh, in its its potential reach. Um, in our conversation, one 
uh, last ask that we have for you um, was in our conversation, we thought about the applied um, work that Hillman himself did in his involvement with the uh, uh, men's movement, uh, in his partnership and mentorship uh, with Michael Mead as a mythologist who has sort of its own uh, growth in this uh, uh, in this overall plant where uh, where you're becoming part of now too, we feel like there uh, to have some acknowledgement, maybe not a whole chapter, but uh, some uh, reference to the applied, uh, messy, uh, muddled work of of men trying to rediscover something different in the, about the masculine and how Hillman himself uh, and and Mead maybe have been uh, involved in this work for for many years um, that you can sort of make the link to that uh, parallel uh, brotherhood of uh, um, reimagining uh, male thinkers uh, and, and workers with that realm. Um, so we don't want to ask for a whole chapter on that, and we want to be in conversation with you and how you see it fit and that it uh, has a sort of organic place in what you're trying to do, but uh, some form of acknowledgement and uh, connection with that, that would be the last thing that we uh, want to ask for uh, from you. Yeah. And I don't think we would ask if we didn't think it was going to be useful to you. Like there's something, it's like a branch of your tree that you're part of that is actually really alive and it's got a lot of birds twittering in it and things happening. And um, I liked what Helga said about this is part of your, your community. Um, and Hillman is deeply, has been deeply devoted to that branch of development uh, that you are, that's part of your tree, your family tree right now. So yeah. Um, but only so, if it feels called, if you feel called, like it's not an interruption of your flow, it's just an invitation to, to find the deeper roots and contemporary expressions of this mythology and, and men's healing. Yeah. I, I guess, I guess to me that feels like the, like the kind of the next chapter of my own explorations in my life in many ways. Um, it, it's difficult for me to like I'm trying to imagine where the, where that would fit in, or um, so I don't know. I don't know if that's something that is being is being acquired or is being invited, and um, how how we have that conversation about that. I wonder if there's anything that's that Hillman has written about himself about men, the men's movement, and the men's work, and his own involvement in that that he was involved with until he passed on. It was sort of ongoing work for him. So not so much his, but how he took the therapy into that work. Just something like, a, just a footnote, not even of how it's a living, an ongoing tradition that's still like messy mm. and in the woods and drums and oh my God. And it's, and it's not always easy for men to do this work together. And Hillman was in the thick of it himself with his orneriness and- <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Let's uh, let's yeah. let's have this conversation um, uh, offline um, and and figure out how there could be an organic an organic fit. Maybe you know uh, in some way that I could imagine it in the conclusion. You know, outlook towards future research and towards uh, future developments, uh, connections with existing. Maybe there can be a few paragraphs like that. Uh, you know, acknowledging that part of the uh, of the tree that has that has been growing as well yeah uh, but not to you know redirect in some major way what you've already done and accomplished yeah so that's a caveat and uh, let's talk about it in more detail or you let it sink in and how you could imagine it and then we'll take it from there overall we're very very pleased with your work uh, we uh, want to uh, let everybody know that uh, your work is accepted. Yeah, we'll, we'll find this last loose end in satisfactory ways, I'm sure. And it's my honor to be the first one to call you Dr. Julian Michaels. Congratulations uh, to this uh, really beautiful accomplishment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here.
This is the moment you can unmute yourself uh, so we can hear your clapping and your champagne popping or uh, whatever wants to happen. Congratulations, Julian. It was a real pleasure uh, and an honor to, to be part of this. Yeah, it's been an incredible journey. Incredible journey. The great Most... Pan is alive. You know that shout. The great Pan. He's alive. He's still alive. He's alive. <laughs> we shout I've out at you. <laughs> I've seen him. You probably have too. <laughs> Very good. So we will stay in touch, uh, be in touch in the next few days to uh, uh, help wrap things up with you. And um, yeah, that's that's all for today. Anybody else uh, wants to hang around? If you want to hang around with people, for we can leave the room open. I'll have to go. Uh, I'm sure some others uh, as well. Sorry, we took a little bit longer than we thought we would. But uh, thanks again, everybody, for being here, for your support uh, today or before, uh, maybe lifelong. And I'm looking at uh, uh, Julian's father here. Thank you all. Thank you, Julian. Uh, good luck. Best wishes for the uh, continued uh, turns and twists that your work and your own journey will take. Thank you very much, Helga. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.